Hi everyone, thank you for joining us for another episode of Table Talk. My name is Gabriel, I'm one of the staff at the Crossing Church. Today we're going to be talking about lust and the Christian. Now, 2012 was declared the year of lust uh, by the Singaporean media because of the many high-profile sex scandals that we've been seeing in the press. And lust is something that a lot of Christians uh, struggle with. Uh, not just men, but uh, increasingly women as well. Um, if you're a Christian that's struggling with lust, uh, we hope that this video will be an encouragement to you. Um, know that you're not alone in this. And to talk about this issue, we have with us David Cook. Uh, David was the former principal at Sydney Missionary Bible College in Australia. He's currently the, one of the pastors at Chinese Presbyterian Church in Sydney. And uh, he also spends a lot of his time uh, traveling around the world to teach the Bible. David, thank you for coming. Thanks, Gabriel. Nice to be here. Well, um, let's start with maybe some definitions just so that we're clear on uh, what lust is. What is lust? What is it not? And what does the Bible say about it? Well, I guess lust is a, a, a mental desire for something. Mm-hmm. Uh, in the Bible, it's generally associated with um, sexual activity, mm-hmm. and therefore it's something that, which is to be avoided at all costs, according to the Lord Jesus. Mm-hmm. So adultery is one of the commandments, do not commit adultery. Um, but the Lord Jesus took that and said that if you have lust in your heart, that is, if you, uh, you have the strong desire to have uh, adultery mm-hmm. with a person, then that you've committed adultery in your heart. In other words, adultery in the mind is adultery. We should be clear, I guess, about what adultery is. Adultery is sexual activity or the thought of it Mm. with anyone with whom you are not in the lifelong covenant of marriage. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I I think we've got to affirm a number of things here. First, we've got to affirm that God invented sex Mm -hmm. and he gave it a particular environment and that environment was the covenant of marriage. Mm. Take it out of that environment and that which is good in one environment becomes destructive in another. It's a bit like petrol in a car. Mm. You put petrol in a car and it's probably good to get you from A to B, but you siphon it off and put it on your barbecue. Mm. Or you put it in a saucer and sniff it, and that which is good in one environment and another is quite destructive. And sexual activity outside the marital relationship is like that. Mm. And so the Bible's most common word for that in the New Testament is the word porneia, from which we get pornography. Mm. It's illicit sexual activity. And um, the other thing I want to say, just as a precursor to this, is that the Bible never makes um, the avoidance of porneia the first line. So the Bible, Christianity always begins with the great indicative, the triumphant indicative, one writer said. That is what God has done. So the Ten Commandments don't say you shall, don't start by saying you shall have no other gods before me. That's verse 3 of Exodus 20. Verse 2 says... I am the Lord your God who redeemed you, therefore you shall have no other gods but me. So redemption always comes first. Mm. So God doesn't say, you keep the Ten Commandments and I will redeem you. He says, I have redeemed you, now you walk consistently with the commandments. Mm. So the Christian never comes and says, right, the first thing I want to say to you is avoid porneia. No, the Christian always comes and says, the first thing I want to say to you is you come to the Lord Jesus Mm. and uh, you won't do that by moral living. You need to repent and come to him. And as a fruit of that, you will have a particular attitude to Pornia. Mm. Now, could I take you, Gabriel, to the Bible and one verse or a few verses in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18 to 20? Because here Paul gives instruction to a fledgling church in a city which did not have a red light area, Mm. but was a red light area, the city of Corinth. Right. So there's sexual immorality everywhere. And Paul says to the new believers in the middle of this red light city, he says, flee from sexual immorality. Now, I just want you to look at those words. Flee from porneia. Mm. Now, I want you to notice about that word that it is a command. He Mm. says flee. It's not a suggestion. You must flee. It is a present tense command, which means you must flee and keep on fleeing. You just don't flee from porneia once. You have to keep on fleeing. Mm. But the other thing about this command is that it's a command to all of the church. It's not just a command to you or to me, but to us. Mm. In other words, we have a responsibility to one another to keep encouraging one another to flee from this monster, Mm. Pornea. 
Now, why do we need to encourage each other to flee from a monster? Because Pornea is actually a very attractive monster. Mm. And although we know it is destructive, there is something in it and in us which attracts us to it. And that's why we need to keep encouraging each other to keep on fleeing, to keep on getting out of it. Someone said the only way to beat sexual temptation is with your hat, grab it and run. And we need to encourage each other to do that. Now, what's interesting in these verses is Paul just doesn't give the instruction, keep on fleeing, keep on encouraging one another to flee sexual immorality. But he gives them two reasons why they should. Now, it's interesting the two reasons he gives them why they should. They are both theological reasons. Now, I know a lot of people when it comes to theology says, oh, that's terribly dull. But the reality is that Christianity is doctrinal. It is theological. And Paul doesn't say flee from sexual immorality because it's going to be bad for you physically or because it's going to be bad for you emotionally or it's going to be bad for you or the other party psychologically. Mm -hmm. All those things may be true, but that's not his chief concern. He says, could I read what he says? All other sins a man commits are outside his body, but he who sins sexually sins against his own body. Mm -hmm. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you've received from God? Now, the first reason, therefore, I will flee from sexual immorality is because this body is inhabited by God, the Holy Spirit himself. And therefore, to join this body in an illicit way with another body is to defame, if you like, the Holy Spirit himself. It is to grieve the Holy Spirit. So because of my doctrine of the body and for the Christian, the body is important, I will flee sexual immorality. But the second reason he gives, he goes on, you are not your own. You were bought at a price, therefore honour God with your body. In other words, this body is not my body. It doesn't belong to me. Paul says you've been redeemed. Mm -hmm. You've been purchased. You therefore do not belong to yourself. Mm -hmm. You belong to the one who purchased you, and that is Christ. Now, if you could go right back to Exodus 13, where the people of Israel, the firstborn sons of Israel, had the blood of the Passover lamb applied to their doorposts. And when the angel of death came, he passed over the homes of the people of Israel Mm. and their firstborn sons were saved. And you remember what God says to them. He says, now I want you to know that they are no longer your sons. Mm. I have purchased them. I have bought them with the blood of the lamb. They belong to me. And Paul is simply saying that at the cross, when Jesus died, he purchased me. I cannot claim the benefit of being his redeemed person and not recognise the implication. And the implication is that I do not belong to me and therefore my body is not my own to do what I like with, but is the instrument that God has given me to serve him with. And therefore I'm to honour God with my body. That's what Paul says. Now, if you keep your finger there and flip over to one more reading in 2 Corinthians 5... Paul takes this whole issue up of being redeemed. Mm. Verse 14, Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Mm. Now, Paul is now telling us what went through the mind of Jesus on the cross. He died for me to redeem me from selfish living. He gave his life for me so that the life I live will now be his. Now I've been redeemed, I do not own me, it's not mine anymore. Mm -hmm. And Paul says, therefore, use that body which has been redeemed to honour God. Now all of that, you put all that together. So here is a command, here is a continuous command, here is a command in which we're all involved with the order and encourage each other, because we've got a strong doctrine of the body and we've got a strong doctrine of redemption. Now, that's why we are to walk in, in, in this way. Now, the last thing I would say, and this is what I'm constantly saying to young people I meet, God does not tell us this because he's a killjoy. Right. He tells us this because it's good for us. Mm. It is good for us. If you go the way of pornea and the way of addiction in that way, it is a destructive way, and it's similar to throwing <laughs> petrol on your barbecue. And on that note... Um talking about the consequences of following to lust. I mean, as a pastor, you counsel a lot of people uh, that struggle with lust uh, and fallen into it. Um, From your experience, what are some of the consequences that you see uh, 
of people falling into lust? Well, uh, the, the reality is that it's insatiable. It, mm. it's, it, it just will never be satisfied. Right. It, it just gets, becomes a greater and greater hunger. Mm. And also it becomes a demeaning thing that you are actually treating other people like less than people made in the image of God. You're disrespecting yourself, you're disrespecting others, you're disrespecting God by what you're doing. Mm. And uh, it will, you'll de just develop addictive behaviour. And so you're to resist that. Um, could, what do you say to people that say, I mean, isn't God in some way to be blamed for our lust? I mean, he made us sexual beings with uh, insatiable sexual appetites, mm. some of us. Uh, so isn't it a bit harsh for, like for example, Jesus talks about, uh, you know, it's, it's better for you to, uh, if your eye causes you to sin, you should gorge it out. If your hands cause, cause us to sin, we should cut them off. Isn't that yeah. a bit harsh to say that? Well, it's not, it's not harsh if, God, if it's realistic and God warns us. He says you have this tremendous capacity in you, which is a wonderful gift. It's, it's a wonderful capacity. Hmm. Every capacity that God gives us, which is wonderful, has the seeds in it. If we take it too far and if we express it in wrong ways of being ultimately destructive. Hmm. And it's very good that God says that you have sexuality it is a wonderful gift I've given to you. Use it in a way which honours me and respects me and respects yourself. Mm. And I'm glad personally he tells me that. Right. Uh, because I, I, I need that sort of encouragement and warning. Mm. See, Calvin in his Institutes of the Christian Religion, which probably is the greatest piece of writing since the Bible, this is how he starts. All true wisdom consists of two parts. Knowledge of God and knowledge of ourselves, and these two are connected by many ties. Right. Now, therefore, if I really want to know me, I need to know God. Mm. I will not know me if I do not know God. And the key to knowing me is knowing God. And when I know God through his son, Jesus, he's telling me all sorts of things about myself. And he's telling me that I have great capacity for good and great capacity for destruction and evil. Mm. And so I need to avoid the one and embrace the other. Now, I think it's very good of God to say, you've got this, it's a gift, it's a precious gift. Use it in a way that glorifies me. Now, I noticed that the education department in Chicago have just, or, or a few years ago now, have introduced a new project to encourage girls in the high schools in Chicago to say no to sex. And they've called it Project Reality. Hmm. Now, isn't that an in interesting thing? That even the secularists see that this is realistic and this is good. Save sex for someone special mm. and then enjoy a lifetime of it with that someone special. Interesting. Well, um, so what do you say to the person that says, well, since God gave me this sexual uh, appetite and desire, shouldn't he be kind of blamed for my lust? No, you shouldn't be blamed for it. What God has given you is he's given you an appetite and he's given you the direction of how to express that appetite. Mm. Now, if, if again, you shake your fist at him and say, well, blow you, I'm going to take this and express it in a completely different way, mm. and I'll blame you for the consequences. You can hardly blame God, God for the consequences if he says, don't do that, because these are the consequences. Mm. What hope does uh, Christian, Christianity have for us that struggle with lust? Uh, well, God forgives, no matter what your sexual history. Mm. You can come to God through Jesus in repentance, and God will forgive you completely. And he does another thing. He gives you the Holy Spirit to live in you. And all of a sudden you will have a person who lives in you, the person of God, the Spirit himself, who will encourage and strengthen you to say no to lust mm. and to flee it. And you'll be joined to a church of people, a body of people who will care about you and to whom you can be accountable and you can talk frankly about these things. And let me say that if, you, if your struggle is with same-sex attraction, mm. go to a church because you'll be most welcome there. Um, the Bible says that many people from same-sex attraction relationship came to know Christ. Mm. But it's not easy. Mm. Uh, just as um, uh, homosexual attraction and heterosexual attraction are equally difficult to avoid if that's your particular temptation. Mm. But go to a church where you will be helped and encouraged and you'll be encouraged to express your sexuality in a God-honouring way, which ultimately will be good for you. Mm. Well, now with technological advancement, uh, you know, everybody has the internet in their hands, and that's great. But one of the consequences of that is uh, pornography is more easily available now mm. than ever. Um, what are some practical ways that uh, we can actually um, 
fight against it? Well, it's a very good question, and, I, and I, what I would encourage you to do is to be hard on yourself, be ruthless on yourself. Mm. Now, I'm not being legalistic and saying this, this, this is the way it works for me. I am ruthless on myself. I will not go onto the internet um, into anything but uh, uh, sites that I've only ever been and will go on in the middle of my family room, mm. for example. I won't, when I'm travelling alone, for example, go into uh, bookshops, uh, news agencies, all that sort of thing, and spend all my time going in there. Mm. I think you've got to set clear principles for yourself. I, I gather on the internet there's all sort of triple X rated places. Just don't go there. I don't want to go there. I'm so glad I never started smoking because I think I would find it very difficult to give it up. I don't want to start with pornography. Now, if you have started with pornography, make a complete break. Take the stuff and burn it or whatever. Make yourself accountable. Get yourself a dance guardian uh, which will watch over you and protect you and report all the sites you're going to to someone else. Somehow build in uh, an accountability program for yourself. But I would say be ruthless on yourself. Mm. Yeah. And, and do that and remember you probably will slip mm. and so come back to God in repentance and faith and ask him again to fill you with the spirit and the spirit will help you as you walk in godliness right. on that note um, what would you say to people that are in patterns of uh, following the pornography so they, they slip into pornography and then they call, come back to God for repentance and they slip into pornography over and over again and after a while um, it might seem a bit hypocritical for them to come back to God. Mm -hmm. What would you say to a mm -hmm. person? Keep coming, keep coming back to God, but inject some person there as well. Go to a senior leader of your local church and mm -hmm. say, I'm having this problem. I want to make myself accountable. Right. Mm -hmm. Because as I said here, it's a, it's a plural. Flee sexual immorality, all of you. We have a responsibility to one another to look one another in the eye and say, how are you walking in sexual integrity? Tell me about that. Mm. And I'll tell you about me. Right. On that note, um, what are some of the ways we can actually help Christian friends that might be struggling with pornography, uh, apart from uh, actually asking them? Yeah. Uh, knowing that it's a very sensitive and private yeah. topic, yeah. how do we do it lovingly in a sensitive way? Well, we ought to pray for them, but my view is that it's always, you must always pray. It's never enough to do things without prayer, but it's never enough generally just to pray. Right. You must pray and do something. Mm. Now, therefore, you will move towards them, uh, and offer your services of accountability, but they may not want to talk to you about it. Mm. But there may be someone, there's got to be someone in the congregation who can talk to them about it. Mm. Perhaps do a series of sermons on it. How often have we heard a series of sermons on sexual integrity from the pulpit? Do some Bible studies on it. And then you'll generally find as a result of that that people will come out mm. and talk to someone about it and just be ready then to move towards them to start reading the bible with them to pray give them good literature there's lots of good literature which will encourage them to strengthen themselves in this area do you have any personal books to recommend uh, for anybody that's struggling with pornography um, lust or same-sex attraction uh, no but there's lots around i mean there's that one by vaughan roberts uh, i think it's called hot topics or something and okay. there's i know smbc's got one out on various issues of the 21st century um, but they're, they're around i mean if you go into a bookshop i don't have any particular favorites right but um i think just 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 make sure you you get something that reminds you of who you are in christ that's the most important thing right and make yourself accountable to someone in the local congregation. Mm. Okay. Thank you, David. Yeah. Thanks very much, Gabriel. We'll be uh, adding a few links as to some books that you can get uh, at the bottom of the video description down below, uh, so you can check it out. Thank you.